Hello everyone, my name is Aravind Krishna. I'm a program manager in the Azure Cosmos DB team. In this session, I'll show you how to build a massive scale, globally distributed database app in minutes with Azure Cosmos DB. Before we go get down to writing apps, uh, let's take a step back to see how Azure Cosmos DB came to be. Uh, back in 2010 or 2011, there were a number of teams within Microsoft that had, that had uh, very similar requirements. Uh, these were teams uh, within Office, within uh, the online services, within Xbox. All of these teams were building globally distributed applications. And uh, they, they quickly realized that in order to build massively scalable, reliable applications, uh, they needed a globally distributed database under the covers. So this is the sequence of events that led to the creation of Azure Cosmos DB. So why is this important? Why do you need a distributed database? Um, one reason, of course, the first one that comes to mind is uh, you need a database that is highly available. And by highly available, I mean four nines, so 99.99% availability, or five nines, so 99.999% availability. So what does this mean? Uh, in order to support uh, this high availability, the database has to, has to be spread across multiple physical servers. So hardware failures doesn't affect your availability so much. You can roll out upgrades to your database application, your OS, uh, uh, perform OS patches without bringing down the availability of your application. Uh, a critical component to this is, of course, can the database continue to serve reads and writes uh, in the event of a regional failure? So can the application be more highly available than the availability of a single region? So uh, that was one reason to have a globally distributed database. Uh, the second reason was, was scalability. So can the database scale? So one of the big concerns for all of these, all of the engineering teams uh, who were building these applications was, uh, can I write my application with a design that will survive 10x growth, that will survive 100x growth, uh, without having to re-architect my entire application as my request volume increases or my storage size increases? Uh, Cosmos DB lets developers do this. And uh, this is because uh, it can seamlessly scale your data across multiple partitions, multiple servers, or even uh, multiple geographic regions uh, based on growth of, of data. In addition to this, of course, Cosmos DB lets you scale throughput. So if you have requests, uh, uh, if your request rate starts from going to thousands of millions of requests per second, then, then it can seamlessly allow that scalability. So harnessing the full elasticity of the cloud um, and, and this has, it, this is not just affects uh, performance, but it also affects the total cost of ownership. So how can uh, the database be cost effective for these large scale applications? Uh, was another problem that uh, we set out to solve. And in addition to this, can the database be fast and responsive, regardless of the amount of data under storage? So uh, another goal was, um, we are using distribution, can the database serve uh, low latency, single digit millisecond reads and writes uh, regardless of the amount of data under storage or regardless of the number of requests going on at the same time. Now, uh, in addition to all of these, these benefits of distribution, uh, there are also some considerations around availability. And namely, this was uh, how does the application roll out schema upgrades or perform index management? So how do you uh, make changes to the schema of your application without affecting the underlying availability? So uh, one of this this led to the conclusion that the database has to be schema as well as index agnostic. So a database that has all of these capabilities is distributed as well as a schema and index agnostic. Uh, so this was, this was the goal of Cosmos DB. And in addition to this, of course, as your data is distributed, how does the database uh, let you write correct distributed systems applications? So applications that don't have the problem of uh, introducing subtle bugs because your data could be replicated at different rates or it could be stale in a remote location. So Cosmos DB also set out to solve the problem of uh, giving developers well-defined trade-offs so uh, they don't have to tra choose between uh, radical extremes like strong consistency or eventual consistency. So uh, this was the history behind Cosmos DB. So what does Cosmos DB provide to you as an application developer? Number one is global distribution. So if you look at Azure, Azure has the biggest footprint of regions uh, among any cloud provider. Uh, you can provision your, your web services, uh, your cloud services in, in any of 40 plus geographic regions as well, including the sovereign regions. 
So what you can do with Cosmos DB is you can take reprovision accounts, and for those accounts, you can associate any subset of these regions. So you can have your, uh, your account running in one region, or two regions, or up to 40 plus regions. And the service seamlessly performs uh, the replication among these regions. The service also provides multi-homing APIs uh, within all of the SDKs, including the .NET SDK, where you can have your app deployed and talking to the endpoint that is closest to it. In addition to this, uh, Cosmos DB provides comprehensive SLS. So uh, the service provides uh, five nines availability for SLA for reads and, and four nines availability SLA for, uh, for uh, all other operations, and it does it across the world. So uh, in addition to this, when you have your application deployed in Cosmos DB, uh, you can perform failovers at any point in time. Uh, you can perform manual failovers of your application and, and Cosmos DB will seamlessly replicate uh, your data and transfer uh, rights to another region. And when you do, when you perform manual failovers, Cosmos DB guarantees that there is no data loss and there is no availability loss to your application. So you can test the business continuity of your application by using manual failovers. Uh, you can also assume that the service will handle regional failures automatically. Uh, within Cosmos DB, you can specify not just uh, um, auto manual failovers, but in the event that a region were to fail down, you can specify the order in which uh, the region's the regional failover should be performed. And this is beneficial because you can make sure that the service fails over your data to a region where your application standby is running. So the service was, was built to provide these capabilities to a developer uh, in order to build these, these highly available globally distributed applications. Uh, the other aspect about Cosmos DB is that uh, it provides uh, the choice of API to developers. Uh, so you can come to Cosmos DB and program with the API of your choice and get the benefit of all these platform capabilities like global distribution. And uh, there are a couple of uh, key advantages to this approach. Uh, number one, uh, if you have different sets of applications that need a key value store or a document uh, store or a graph store, uh, in the past, you had to deploy them on, on different databases, uh, manage them separately, have different semantics for scaling them. And so this, this places a, an operational cost for your application. Uh, what Cosmos DB provides is the same platform capabilities and the manageability uh, across any of these APIs. So you can uh, use the document API to insert data, uh, and then you can perform graph traversals on top of it, and you can seamlessly switch between these APIs. It's a true multi-model API, and, and uh, I'll show you a few more examples how, of how you can use this multi-model uh, capability to your advantage. The third is, is Elastic Scaleout. Now, um, I mentioned this briefly, but in Cosmos DB, you create containers of storage and throughput, and uh, these containers uh, can scale to unlimited storage. And what you do is, uh, when you provision your container, you, you specify a throughput in terms of requests per second, and you specify a partition key uh, to instruct the service that these are uh, the, the data, data, how the data is related to each other, and uh, the service seamlessly scales your data across partitions as it grows. So um, if you start small, if you, you, might, you might end up in one partition, but as your data grows or as your request, request throughput increases, the service can seamlessly scale you across multiple servers. And uh, the service bills you independently for storage and throughput. So within each container, you're only paying four uh, per gigabyte of usage, uh, as well as the provision throughput in terms of requests per second. So if you have uh, different kinds of workloads, workloads that, are, uh, that have a large volume of data under storage but have uh, less amount of request throughput, or the other way around, a small amount of data that's accessed heavily, then Cosmos DB lets you be cost effective for either kind of workload. And lastly, uh, when you deal with, uh, with global distribution, uh, it, the choice of, uh, there, are, there are a bunch of trade-offs that you have as an application developer. Uh, number one, uh, if you take the conventional approach to data replication, uh, you have strong consistency, uh, which is at one end, what it does is make sure that every data is, is durably committed uh, to every, every replica of your data set. Uh, so what this means in terms of uh, global distribution is that writes 
uh, can take higher latency. So you you get a consistent behavior from um, the standpoint of your applications because they would never see a stale data, but the cost that you pay for it is that now your writes take longer. Or when you need to perform reads, you might have to consult multiple copies of your data to retrieve the latest uh, latest version of data, So, which means that uh, your, your throughput is, uh, you now need twice the throughput to serve uh, strongly consistent reads. And on the other end of the spectrum, you have eventual consistency, which is adopted by a number of applications. But with eventual consistency, uh, you get you get great performance. You get low latency. Uh, you get lower throughput. But uh, this also means that uh, your application has no guarantees as to uh, if your data that is that it's reading is, is stale or if it's up to date. So what we found is that there are many gray uh, area, like there are many click stops in between. So you don't have to choose between these radical extremes of strong consistency and eventual consistency. So Cosmos DB provides these click stops, um, including bounded staleness, which means that um, if your application, your application might read stale data, but the service guarantees that it will never be more stale than your specified window. Uh, the service also provides session consistency, which is uh, which is great for a large number of applications, which are user oriented or session oriented. Uh, you can take the example of uh, uh, a social media app uh, that that needs to perform uh, reads and writes for a user. That's it's it's all user focused. Like for example, uh, if you make an update to your uh, your Twitter account or, or your your Facebook account. Uh, what session consistency provides is that you will get strong consistency uh, for writes that are made um, that for your own writes. So you can read your own writes, and you always see reads. You, you get monotonic reads. Uh, this means that uh, when you perform an, uh, an update to your profile and you click refresh, you will always see your updates. Uh, but your friends, however, might see them in uh, see them out of order or see a delayed copy of the data. Uh, but this this gives you that great experience. Uh, for users who are updating their own profiles, which is uh, so you get you get the best of both worlds of strong consistency and eventual consistency, and uh, consistent prefix is another uh, click stop which guarantees that uh, you never see out of order writes. So here, uh, Cosmos DB, what it does is 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 very similar to how um, a databases, relational databases, codified isolation levels. Here, uh, the service provides consistency levels with. Uh, with real-world practical applications, as well as uh, uh, behavior that you can rationalize as, as an application developer. The service also provides uh, a single-digit millisecond latency at any scale. Uh, so what does this mean? So when you perform reads and writes in Cosmos DB, uh, Cosmos DB 1 has, has a write-optimized database engine that's latch-free that's uh, designed for high volume of ingestion. It's, it's uh, customized for modern hardware. So uh, Cosmos DB can, can ingest massive volumes of data at low latency. Uh, when you perform writes in Cosmos DB, uh, they take uh, typically about five to six milliseconds. And at the high end, at the 99th percentile, the service guarantees that writes will complete under 15 milliseconds. And these are uh, quorum committed writes. They're durably committed to disk and synchronously indexed within 15, minute, 15 milliseconds. Uh, now for reads, uh, at the other end, Cosmos DB is able to exploit uh, the performance of its uh, engine uh, to perform uh, automatic index against the content as it gets ingested. So it also lets you perform low latency reads. Now, uh, if you're looking, performing reads by ID, Cosmos DB provides uh, about a second to a millisecond to two milliseconds for reads, and at the high end, it guarantees an upper bound that reads will always complete. Uh, under uh, 10 milliseconds at the 99th percentile. So there are, uh, this is of course within the scope of a data center, uh, but um, one thing to realize is if your user base is spread across the world, um, there are two components to latency. The first component to latency is how fast the database is, and the second is how much time it takes for the data to get transmitted um, from one, from where your user sits uh, to where, uh, or, or where your application runs to where the database is. And this is, uh, this cannot be any faster than the speed of light between these two locations. Uh, if you have a database that's running in, in the West US and you have, uh, 
applications running in Australia, for example, then it, it would take 250 milliseconds just for the transmission of that data alone. So a key to this is bringing data close to where your users are or where your application runs. In Cosmos DB, uh, because it's globally distributed, regardless of where your application is running, you can get this single digit millisecond latency uh, anywhere in Azure. And lastly, uh, in Cosmos DB provides um, comprehensive industry leading SLAs. And this includes, uh, of course, within a region you get four nines availability. Uh, in, addition to consist in, in addition to availability, the service also provides uh, SLAs on consistency. So the service will never give you a read uh, that, is, uh, you know, that does not satisfy the given consistency level, so in terms of staleness. Uh, the service guarantees that your provision throughput is available to your application. Uh, the service also guarantees uh, um, your latency. Uh, uh, latency, so uh, reads, reads will always complete under 10 milliseconds, and writes always complete within 15 milliseconds. So uh, to sum things up, the way uh, Cosmos DB works is it provides all of these platform capabilities. So uh, single digit millisecond latency, uh, turnkey global distribution, uh, it lets you uh, provides you well-defined consistency levels to build um, correct distributed systems applications, elastic scaling of storage and throughput. And on top of this, it provides a bunch of these APIs. Uh, and on one end is the, the core API, which is uh, SQL and, and JavaScript based. Uh, it, is, uh, um, it, it's, it's, it used to be called the Document DB API. And uh, in addition to this, the service also provides a number of uh, APIs for popular uh, uh, first party and third party NoSQL services, uh, including Table API, which is uh, similar to the Azure Table Storage Service, uh, MongoDB API, and Gremlin, which is, which is for graph traversals. Uh, so in this uh, session, uh, we'll look at what it takes to build applications using .NET and uh, a couple of these APIs. So first, uh, let's let's build a simple app. Now, to begin with, uh, uh, let's not worry about global scale. Let's let's build a simple uh, to-do list application. Uh, so what this does is it's it's an AS, a single page ASP.NET MVC app uh, that lets you add to-do list items, and uh, it uses the Cosmos DB behind the scenes to store these items and query over these items. So let me switch over to my um, screen and uh, this is good. Awesome. So uh, let's take a quick look at, at getting started with Cosmos DB and writing your first app. So um, let, let's first create a Cosmos DB account. So I am in the Azure portal, that's portal.azure.com. In here, I navigate to databases, uh, pick Cosmos DB, let me call it .NET Conf, Cosmos DB, and API, I'll pick the SQL Cosmos DB API. I'll use my resource group. And location, I'll pick West US since that's closest to where I am in, uh, in Redmond. And the service also lets you uh, enable geo redundancy by default, so it picks a second region, uh, so you can remain highly available in case of disaster. Uh, I will skip this for now. So I'll kick off create, and uh, this will create a Cosmos DB account in, in, in a couple of minutes. So what I'll do is, uh, let me switch over uh, while this account is being created uh, to another account that I've already created up front. So uh, this account, uh, is is uh, has is created with a SQL API. It's ready to go. Now the first thing that you do when you get set up, set up with Cosmos DB uh, is you can go to the Quick Start and download uh, a completed application that is uh, configured with with the connection string and it's ready to run. So uh, let me run through the steps in the Quick Start. So I find Quick Start in the left navigation and I click uh, Create this Items Collection. So this will be used by Cosmos DB uh, to store my to-do list items and uh, this should get created shortly. And I can click download, and this will download uh, this ASP.NET application. So uh, I have this already unzipped over here. So this is my .NET application that I downloaded from there. Uh, let me switch over. Uh, so this is the application. So let's take a quick look 
at uh, the web.config in this application. So in web.config, you'll see a couple of uh, interesting properties. So this is, uh, this is the endpoint of my account. We just uh, saw this over in, at the portal. And this is the authorization key for my account. Uh, it has a couple of other settings like database and collection uh, that are used to store these items. Now in packages.config, uh, you'll see that uh, uh, we have a dependency on uh, uh, Newtonsoft uh, and, uh, and of course uh, on Cosmos DB. So this is the SDK for uh, Cosmos DB. So let's, uh, let's look at the code real quick. So there is a single controller here. Uh, this is for creating items. And uh, much of the heavy lifting is performed by the repository class. So let's run through this really quickly. Um, let me launch my to-do list application. And this will, this will start my ASP.NET uh, application. So I have uh, no to-do list items. So let me go create .NET conf. And let's just put some description over here. This is cool. Click Create. So I have, uh, let me create another one, another one. This is also cool. So I have uh, created a bunch of these uh, to-do list items. So let's, uh, let's look, look through the code to see what, what we have to do to set this up. So um, this is, again, uh, let me go load my source explorer in this. this. So, uh, so here I have a simple controller. So this is my item controller, and as you can see, uh, it has a bunch of methods. Uh, most of the heavy lifting is performed by this uh, uh, document DB repository class. So let's skip ahead to the repository class. Uh, in the repository class, uh, you have a bunch of these, these methods. Uh, so for example, you have get items async, get items, item async that takes an ID, and all it does behind the scenes uh, is, is it calls redocument async, uh, which is a property in uh, the Cosmos DB SDK. And uh, it returns a document back, and here we uh, dynamically cast it uh, to the type T that we need uh, for uh, the repository. And uh, that's, that's pretty much it, and it, can, it, it handles cases where uh, the item's not found and it throws a document client exception. Uh, you also have get items async, so this is what we use um, in the front end to display all of the items that need to be completed. So here uh, you see we have a link query. So this is Cosmos DB's link provider. And uh, you can see it takes some arguments that let you optimize how the query is executed. So in this case, this, uh, this is the number of items that are, 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 that are returned uh, in every round trip to the server. And you also see that uh, it takes a predicate which is uh, passed uh, right to the link provider. And this is executed efficiently on the server as a SQL query. Uh, I'll show you a little bit of what happens behind the scenes here. And furthermore, uh, create item is just, just a thin shim around uh, create document async. Update item is just a, a shim around a replace document async. Same for uh, delete document async. Uh, there is also a method in here for initialization. So what it does is it, it simply creates a database if it doesn't exist. Uh, and if uh, the collection, which is the, the container of uh, storage and throughput, if it doesn't exist, then again, Cosmos DB, I mean, the, the repository class simply creates it. And as you notice, one of the options uh, that are passed into the collection creation is the, is the request throughput in terms of uh, uh, request units per second. So uh, what happens when you uh, trigger these calls behind the scenes? So I have a, a fiddler open, and this kind of uh, tells you uh, what these calls, uh, how these calls from the SDK to get translated to the Cosmos DB service. Uh, so uh, let me switch over to this. And so uh, these are, so, uh, so this is the first call, which gets the metadata for, uh, for the particular account endpoint. And in this case, of course, uh, the response that comes back uh, from the service uh, returns uh, a bunch of a a configuration as well as the readable endpoints uh, of the account. So the, the client SDK can at, at any point uh, dynamically fall back between uh, these regions in case of a regional failure. Uh, the service also sends back the current write endpoint as well as the read endpoints. Uh, so the service, uh, so the client SDKs know how to route reads and writes. The next response, of course, is uh, we create a database 
Um, and then once we create a database, the service also sends back, uh, create a database and create a collection. The service uh, sends back metadata about the collection. So in this case, uh, the service sends back the indexing policy. Um, it also sends back information such as uh, how the, the topology of that collection, how the data is, is spread across physical partitions. Uh, because the client SDK uh, then can use this information to make uh, connections directly to data partitions for, for really low latency access. Then we get to the part where uh, um, where we see uh, the, the item, the, the part of the page that displays items uh, for uh, to-do list items that need to be performed. And here, uh, you can also see what happens over here is that the service sends a SQL query. So you see a post made against Cosmos DB and, and a SQL query that gets run uh, over the, that gets sent over the wire. And uh, of course, in this case, uh, the, initially, you had no items come back, and as we added more and more items, uh, you see that uh, two items got sent back from the service. So uh, let's take a closer look at uh, what what this what it what it's like to work with this query. Uh, at any point in time, you can go uh, to the data explorer in Cosmos DB uh, and uh, run SQL queries against it. The same SQL query that you saw uh, the link provider uh, translate to. So, for example. Uh, the data that I inserted, .NET Conf, and the other another one, I can I can run a query to say, uh, get me all of these items, and if I wanted to, uh, for example, uh, edit an item, I can go edit this item, mark it completed, and now when I switch back here, I can I can for example find the item that I marked as completed. So uh, while we get the data explorer loading, okay, it's right here. While we get that loading, let me walk you through a couple of other options. So uh, we we looked at a simple to-do list application. So this application is built for a uh, thousand requests per second. So what do we need to do if we want to scale this application to a million requests per second? So uh, in this example, let me take a look at uh, the changes that I would have to make to make this application run at massive scale. The first thing I'm going to do is configure a partition key for my collection. So in this case, uh, let me copy the same definition. So I have a document collection. Then I have to set a partition key for my account. So what I'll do is set, uh, so in this case, we have a bunch of to-do list items, and uh, most of our access is by ID. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick ID as the partition key for my collection. So I pass in this definition to create a document collection. And what I'm going to do is simply change the throughput of my collection, 10,000, 100,000, 1 million. So this is pretty much all you need. Uh, if you need to scale this exact same to-do list application to a million requests per second. And Cosmos DB can handle the splitting of data, the routing of requests uh, to handle that throughput seamlessly. Of course, in this example, I showed you how to uh, create a collection upfront for a million requests per second. Uh, you don't have to start that way. You could always start with a uh, thousand requests per second. And as your data grows, uh, you can increase it to a million requests per second. Um, but the key to this, of course, is ensuring that you have um, a partition key definition for your collection so the service uh, can can um, distribute your data across multiple partitions. Uh, th uh, the service would never split a partition key across multiple uh, multiple physical partitions because it provides uh, full asset transaction guarantees within the scope of a partition key. So the second aspect, so now that we have our application scaled out, so we are back um, for um, this thing, so I'll quickly show you uh, the query that I wanted to run. Um, so you can run is complete equals true, or you can go, for example, extend this query to run 
select a count of one. So you can perform aggregations. You can run all of these queries on the Cosmos DB collection. So uh, now that we looked at scaling horizontally across partitions, uh, let's look at what uh, global distribution looks like. So in, in every account, you can configure a number of region accounts, the number of regions associated with it. So in here, in my account, I have configured West US as my read region, and I have configured uh, three other, as my write region, I have configured three other read regions. Uh, so at any point between uh, these regions, I can perform a manual failover to another region by clicking, I understand that uh, I, I'm about to perform a manual failover to my region. Uh, I can also perform, um, I can enable automatic failover, and I can sp specify the list of priorities. I can move um, the priority of these regions to match the topology of my application as deployed in other regions. So once you have deployed your application in, in my multiple regions, uh, how do you configure this application, for example, this to-do list application, uh, to read from all of these different endpoints, to read from the copy of data that's closest to it? So uh, let me switch back uh, to my application. So initially, of course, let's assume that uh, this, is, this is the application that I would deploy uh, to the West US region. Uh, in that case, uh, I need to make no changes to the application because uh, the client SDK will, will preferentially talk to the right region by default. But uh, what if I was to deploy this application to the East US uh, uh, region and, uh, and have it read from the East US endpoint? So what I can do is configure the connection policy of my account. So in connection policy, there is a property called preferred locations. In preferred locations, uh, you can specify the regions in the order of preference. So in this case, I'm running uh, in East US region. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have it read from East, East US region first. So I say first preference is East US, uh, and then of course, in case East US were to fail, uh, I want a fallback, so I'll have it read from West US as the secondary preference. And for best performance, uh, we recommend that uh, you always set uh, connection mode to direct and connection protocol to TCP, which is a lightweight protocol. So in this mode, what, what the SDK would talk directly to the data partitions uh, instead of uh, talking through the document DB uh, gateway, so you get lo lower latency, it could be up to a millisecond difference uh, by picking direct connectivity. And, uh, and pass this to the argument of my SDK. And uh, let me switch this back. So that's, uh, that's pretty much what you need uh, to initialize your connection policy. I guess my naming was off, so I call it as connection policy. So uh, this is pretty much all you need uh, to configure your account uh, in the East US region using the multi-homing APIs. Uh, now when you're deploying your application to West US, uh, what you would do is switch the order between these preferred locations. So you would read from the West US location preferentially and fall back to the East US location uh, as, as secondary. So this is pretty much how you configure multi-homing APIs and extend your to-do list application to run uh, across um, a large number of servers. So that was the Cosmos DB uh, API. Now let's, uh, let's look as, as part of the next demo. Uh, let me show you about how to move from Azure Table Storage to Cosmos DB. Now uh, Azure Table Storage was, uh, was one of the, the first uh, highly scalable NoSQL uh, data storage uh, services on Azure. Um, if you have applications that are written using Azure Table Storage 
and you need uh, these capabilities such as single digit millisecond latency, uh, if you need automatic secondary indexes, if you need global distribution, uh, you can easily port those applications to Cosmos DB with no code changes to your application. And this is using the Cosmos DB's uh, table API, uh, which, which, is, which works with uh, .NET. So in this, session, in this uh, section, let me walk you through uh, how you can get started with the table API for Cosmos DB. So uh, in this example, um, what I've done is I have created a Cosmos DB account uh, using the table API. So let me switch to that account. So uh, this account uh, that I have over here is created with the table API. And as you can see um, here, of course, I have uh, in my quick start, I, I have uh, instead of the Cosmos DB API uh, quick starts, I have uh, table API based quick starts. And um, the table API based quick starts, um, let me switch over to the Visual Studio uh, a project that has a table API quick start. So uh, this is very similar. If you're a developer who is, who is used to Azure Table Storage, it looks identical. And one of the key differences, of course, is in place of uh, the storage NuGet package, uh, you have to switch to use the premium table Windows Storage premium table NuGet package, uh, which is identical uh, to the, 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 the storage SDK in terms of uh, API signatures uh, and compatibility. Uh, but what it provides is the ability to talk to uh, a table that's created on Cosmos DB as well as regular uh, standard uh, table storage. So if you look at this application, uh, this is pretty much just using uh, the ta table storage API. Uh, so you have uh, a connection string, uh, and within the connection string, you, 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 uh, you get a, a cloud table client. And within the cloud table client, uh, pretty much we, we call table, uh, table create if not exists. Uh, and then we skip ahead and call table operation uh, execute. And so this is uh, an insert that gets pre performed using the table SDK. Uh, we have retrieves, which are, which are gets by partition key and row key. Uh, we also have uh, table query. So this is uh, queries that, that are performed in table storage. Um, and, and of course, uh, a delete operation. So all of this is, is, is pretty standard uh, table storage SDKs. Uh, but they can run against Cosmos DB. And the benefits that you will see, uh, for example, in the, in the case of the query, uh, is because Cosmos DB has automatic indexing against all properties, uh, this query on email will still get executed against index and be performed efficiently. Uh, you can also uh, control things such as uh, the provision throughput for your, for your tables. Uh, this can this make sure you, this way you can make sure that your application never gets throttled, uh, even if you exceed the the scalability targets of your of a standard uh, table storage account. So when you provision um, when you create tables from the SDK, uh, you can control by setting the apps going to app settings and configuring table throughput. So in this case, I have configured it to 400 request units. Uh, you can control how much throughput is provisioned for the table. And this throughput is, of course, reserved for you and backed by SLAs. In addition to this, you can also, uh, for example, pass in the consistency le level for your client applications. Uh, you can also set the preferred locations, so similar to how we looked at uh, the multi-homing APIs. Uh, you can set a, a list of preferred regions, and you can have table storage running at, at four nines availability within regions or five nines across regions uh, for mission-critical applications using the premium API. So uh, that is pretty much all you need to get started uh, with, the, with the table storage API for Cosmos DB. Uh, let's now take a look at, uh, at the new API, which is, which is the Gremlin Graph API. Now, Cosmos DB, in addition to uh, the document and key value APIs, uh, lets you perform graph traversals. And now, uh, for performing graph traversals, uh, Cosmos DB uses uh, the open source Gremlin Graph API. So here in this model, uh, you can insert vertices and edges, and you can perform traversals to say, you know, what are all the vertices that satisfy a constraint, and who are who are the friends of a friend, uh, or if you want to build a recommendation system, or if you want to perform fraud detection um, to understand the network and connections between various accounts, you can do those efficiently using the Gremlin uh, Graph API. And what we've done is uh, Gremlin is commonly used uh, in the open source ecosystem with Python and Java. Uh, we have built a first party uh, .NET driver for Gremlin. 
and this is built on top of the Cosmos DB SDK. So you can you get all of the benefits like uh, controlling the serialization of objects uh, to graphs in, uh, reading them back, and uh, integrating with Cosmos DB to perform the same uh, same platform capabilities like configuring collections uh, as well as issuing queries over the underlying data. So uh, let me quickly show you um, what what the quick start for graphs looks like. Um, so this is this is again a Cosmos DB account uh, that is created using the Graph API, and, and you'll notice that this looks uh, very similar to the to the Document uh, DB example that we saw so far. So this is a Document DB client, and this is because uh, Gremlin doesn't have the equivalent of management and and provisioning APIs. Uh, it, it's a, it's a query API for accessing your your data that is under a container. So uh, we perform the exact same steps where we create a database if it doesn't exist. Uh, we create a graph container and we store items inside of it. And then we run a bunch of Gremlin queries. So here uh, you can see in Gremlin syntax, it's, it's much like SQL syntax, but uh, in, a, in a functional language. So here you can call uh, v, g dot v to ec extract all of the vertices. Uh, you can perform a dot drop, which would essentially delete all of the data uh, in your collection. Uh, you can perform add vertex to insert data. You can perform um, you can perform traversals. So in this case, uh, I'm saying um, start with Thomas, find all of the people he knows, and um, you know add uh, add an edge uh, between Thomas uh, to Mary to say that Thomas knows Mary. And so you can insert edges between um, uh, between documents. You can perform traversals. So in this case, I'm finding all of the people in my graph uh, with an age greater than 40. Uh, you can perform traversals to say who are my friends, or who are Thomas's friends of type person, and you can do this any number of times. For example, you can say uh, who, are, uh, who are Thomas's friends and who are their friends, so you get the two-level uh, circle of friends around Thomas. And lastly, uh, you, can, you can build upon this to, to have more powerful logic. So here, uh, this says uh, perform loops or, or um, perform this transitive closure where you find um, all of the, the people, like who are the people that you have to know to get a connection from from uh, uh, Thomas to Robin, and you know who are the people around the seven degrees of separation uh, between these two. So the, this kind of uh, logic, uh, you, this powerful uh, kind of uh, graph operations can be performed using the Graph API. When you're working with Graph API, uh, this uh, works pretty much uh, the same way. Like where uh, you can use I document query and you can call the client or create Gremlin query, and you get an, an I queryable back, and, the, and you can iterate through results. Uh, so, in addition to this, of course, uh, uh, the Cosmos DB SDK also provides uh, first-class properties like uh, like vertices and edges. So you can serialize uh, the data that gets sent back, sent back to graphs and as as you strongly type vertex objects, and you can perform uh, the necessary transformations that you want uh, behind the code. And uh, one of the things that we are uh, working towards uh, is is the ability to switch seamlessly between these APIs. So another sample that we have over here, uh, it shows you how the power of a multi-model API, where you can start uh, using, like in this case, what we did is uh, inserted a bunch of documents which are, uh, which are around um, the information about counties in the, in the state of Washington. So uh, this is information between the counties which we insert uh, using the core uh, document DB API. And what you can do is you can switch over uh, to the graph API and then um, when you're accessing the data in the Graph API, automatically all the documents that you created uh, from the uh, Document DB API are seamlessly translated as vertices in, in the Graph API. So now you can use them to perform graph traversals. So in this example, of course, uh, I start, uh, now I can use the Graph API to add additional counties uh, to my data set. And I can also go over here and say, uh, add relationships, add edges between these states. So what is the road network across uh, these counties? So I insert edges between these, which of course internally also get stored in Cosmos DB as entities. And now that I have my vertices and edges, I can I can run graph traversals to find, you know, what are uh, you know what are all the reachable counties from uh, from from uh, King counties? What are all the counties that can be reached uh, using interstates? So in this case, I'm performing a query over a property of the edge. And of course, uh, you know, what is, how do I 
how do I reach King County? What are the different uh, paths I can take from King County to, to Multnomah County? So you can run repeat until to go find all of these paths. So again, this is very powerful. It has a ton of applications where uh, you have uh, logistics routing or uh, you want to uh, you want to find uh, how one one a component in your IoT infrastructure affects the other, and um, you can you run this on the same underlying uh, data without having to import export it and import it to another different graph database. So uh, in this uh, session, we we looked at at a bunch of different ways to use uh, uh, .NET and uh, Cosmos DB together. Now, Cosmos DB, in the beginning, I talked about the first party applications uh, that were responsible for uh, the creation of Cosmos DB. But today, it's used in a wide range of applications. Uh, for example, Domino's uses Azure Cosmos DB uh, for um, driving its, its ordering pipeline, which needs to be highly available. It needs to be highly responsive in multiple geographies. Uh, Toyota uses Cosmos DB for its, uh, its uh, telematics and connected car platform. So here, um, Vehicle diagnostics get get ingested into Cosmos DB, so it's the fact that it it is highly scalable, it's right optimized, and is very conducive to perform distributed analytics like Spark processing, uh, is is um, was one of the key drivers for Toyota to to move to Cosmos DB. Uh, it's used in a lot of these marketing and analytics platforms as well as uh, user centric applications. Uh, for example, uh, Real Madrid's uh, a social media site. Uh, uses uses um, Cosmos DB to store information about users, about ch chat messages, and their interactions. Uh, Jet.com, which is a, a popular retailer, uh, uh, uses Cosmos DB as an event store, uh, which is used for uh, brokering and coordination of events and, and workflows across multiple microservices. Uh, for example, when their ordering system needs to uh, convey that certain reservations need to be made by the inventory system, uh, it, it simply writes an event to Cosmos DB. And there are multiple consumers of these, of these events using, change, using Cosmos DB's change feed capabilities that listens to these events and perform downstream actions. Uh, and of course, it's, it's used in a, in a wide range of applications, including gaming. Uh, where the, in, in gaming, for example, the, the fact that Cosmos DB can scale uh, in, in a few seconds gives it a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of flexibility for game developers to introduce new features uh, as well as uh, um, add a lot of uh, social f uh, features which need to perform uh, queries against new and changing attributes in Cosmos DB. So uh, you can get started with Cosmos DB at any time. You can go, um, we've recently announced a free offer of Cosmos DB where there is no commitment, there is no sign up, no credit card. Uh, you can go and provision Cosmos DB and, and, and play with any of these APIs. Uh, you can of course also sign up for an Azure account and sign up for a free uh, Cosmos DB account. So uh, I have a question over here. Um, someone asked, uh, is there any significant difference in performance between the different APIs used to access Cosmos DB? Um, so the answer to this is uh, Cosmos DB provides the same SLAs on performance across any of these APIs. Um, but all things being equal, there are some capabilities that are available only in the core API. Uh, for example, uh, in the core document DB API, uh, the service provides a direct connectivity to the data partitions uh, versus having to talk to a gateway that, that forwards the request along. Uh, the service provides native uh, multi-homing APIs and things like it, it can expose uh, uh, retry semantics on request count so it can optimize uh, the retry uh, interval in kinds of failure conditions. So um, in practice, uh, if, you, if you're starting with a brand new application, you should probably use the document DB API, but all, all APIs are treated equal in terms of performance. Uh, there's also another question that asks, uh, uh, are all the same R Python language capabilities available against Cosmos DB? Uh, yes, so in Cosmos DB, uh, you can use R and Python because it's a schema-less database that's really built for dynamic typing. Um, and of course, it's, it's tightly integrated with Spark. Um, so if you want to perform big data and data science uh, based ML and data science based processing, uh, the flexibility as well as the the fact that it can support large volumes of uh, reads and writes makes it makes it super su suitable for for R Python and and any kind of ML ML based framework. So. Um, so in conclusion, Azure Cosmos DB, uh, it's, it's really easy with, with Azure Cosmos DB. You can build uh, globally distributed applications 
uh, just with a few lines of code, the service can scale seamlessly with your application um, in, in the same geography across data centers as well as across uh, multiple geographic regions as, as your application evolves.